Hello, this is my third video on the subject of uh, solar system facts. This is the solar system series, and this part three is called Tidal Forces in the Solar System. This is the third one, like I said, and the first two, let me see if I can expand my, uh, my slide there. The first one was on orbits, and part two is on moons, and these kind of go in order. It's probably best to, to watch these in order. So those two maybe before we get to tidal forces. Of the four that I'm doing, tidal forces are the ones which is probably the most difficult to explain and maybe the most difficult to understand and people don't aren't quite so familiar with it. But I think it's important because this is one of the uh, forces that is changing our solar system. And it's interesting to me, too, because uh, regardless of what your understanding is of the origin of the solar system, tidal forces presents a little bit of a problem for everybody. So I've subtitled this, we've all got some explaining to do. And then my last one, which we'll, I'll do later, is on magnetic fields in the solar system. So once again, the same introduction I've had on the previous, these uh, presentations are not going to prove that God created the solar system, but they are going to provide an understanding of aspects of a solar system that point to a created origin rather than a naturalistic origin. So tidal forces. The, the tides that everybody's familiar with are ocean tides. We're all familiar with ocean tides on Earth. Uh, every day you have, really you have two high tides usually and two low tides, and it causes the ocean water to rise up a little bit. Some places uh, it can rise up as much as several feet above the low tide. That's not at all unusual. Now this is what we would call in the solar system, this is a weak tidal effect. The reason that it's weak is because the tides are raised by the smaller body, the moon, on a larger body, the earth. The tides are caused by the moon's gravity, and the moon is smaller than the earth. So this is a weak effect. There are some tidal forces in the solar system that have much more dramatic effects. We just obviously don't see them because we're not there. We are here. For example, tidal heating due to friction is so great, the, the heat due to friction on Jupiter's moon Io, that it actually causes there to be volcanic activity on Io. It's the most active tectonic planet in the solar system. Not a planet, really. It's just a moon. Or... You could look at a comet. This is comet Shoemaker-Levy 9, but it got torn to pieces by tidal forces when it approached Jupiter in 1992. So tidal forces can really cause pretty dramatic effects. So briefly, what causes tides? Look at the drawing here. The top drawing is, you know, the circle. You can consider that like a planet or a moon or something like that. And there is something to the right of it that is causing a gravitational pull. So you can imagine maybe that top circle would be Earth, and to the right there's the moon or the sun or something. So it pulls on it. Now, the gravitational force on the near side of the body is greater than the far side. And so that produces a residual tidal force. And so on the second uh, circle there, you see a very small arrow pointing to the right and to the left. So let's assume that the moon is to the right. In that case, what that means is that high tide is going to be if you're face on to the moon, or if the moon is on the opposite side of you, it will tend to like stretch out the earth a little bit. And so the bottom picture is, this is blue, because we're going to imagine those are Earth's oceans, and they are raised by the tidal force due to the gravity of Earth's moon. Now, as soon as I put equations up, I'm afraid I'm going to lose half the viewers. So this is the only uh, slide where I'm going to put equations up, but this is important. The force due to gravity, the equation for that, you can see over there on the right-hand side, the force is 
the gravitational constant of the universe times the mass of a primary and the mass of the secondary, the mass of the two bodies multiplied together, divided by you know, that D squared. D is the distance, distance squared. So the distance is the most powerful factor in determining the force due to gravity. But the next one, the tidal force, it's a little bit more complicated uh, equation, but the main thing I wanted to, you to take away from that is that in this case, the tidal force is d cubed. And so that means that the tidal forces are much more sensitive to distance than just gravitational forces are. And that's why the moon affects Earth's tides more than the sun, even though the sun is more massive the tidal force from the moon is greater than the sun. There is a significant tidal force from the sun, it, but it's only about half that of the moon. Those equations, which I just put up, were all figured out by Isaac Newton back in 1686, a really smart guy, and others. So first, let's talk about tidal acceleration. This is a very interesting force because this is also the one which some uh, creation scientists have latched onto and pointed out. So of, of all the things I'm gonna to share today, this is the one that is maybe understood the best. And it's that the moon is moving away from the earth at a rate of 3.8 centimeters per year due to tidal acceleration. Now, what in the world is tidal acceleration? Well, look at that um, diagram there. In the diagram, imagine that the blue is Earth's oceans. Now the Earth's ocean is, the planet is rotating faster than the moon is orbiting. Our planet does a full rotation in 24 hours, one day, whereas the moon takes a full month to go around. So the Earth is spinning a lot faster than the moon is rotating. So the moon pulls those tides out, but then the Earth rapidly uh, rotates them ahead and what happens is that Earth's high tides get a little bit ahead of a direct line to the moon. They get about 10 minutes ahead. Now the gravity from the near side high tide is greater than the far side high tide. And this means that it's gonna cause the moon to actually accelerate a little bit. And while the moon is gonna accelerate, the Earth's rotation is going to slow a little bit. So if the Earth and the Moon were just to continue doing this forever into like an infinite future, what would eventually happen is by accelerating the Moon, the Moon would end up much farther away from Earth, and Earth, its rotation would slow way down till it was actually face on to the Moon at all times, so the Earth's rotation would match the Moon's orbit. We'll never get anywhere close to that, but given an infinite amount of time, theoretically, that would happen. So the Earth is moving away at 3.8 centimeters a year. This was actually confirmed by reflectors that NASA placed on the moon during the Apollo program. But the interesting thing is they knew this was going to be true even before they landed on the moon due to the math equations for tidal acceleration. I only put up the equations for tidal forces when you put up the other equations for all the other tidal things which d are derived from tidal forces, they just get really complicated. But they knew from those uh, equations that the moon would be accelerating away from Earth. Now, at 3.8 centimeters per year, the moon would be about 160,000 kilometers closer to the Earth than it is now, 4.6 billion years ago, or about 40% closer than it is now. So if you're thinking in terms of an old solar system model of 4.6 billion to 5 billion years, that puts the moon a lot closer. However, the tidal acceleration equation is extremely sensitive to distance. It's not just that distance to the third that I showed you on the previous page. It's actually distance raised to the 11 over 2. So that means that in the past, when the moon was a little bit closer, it would have gotten a lot closer, a lot faster. And in effect, it would have put the moon on the surface of the earth about 1.5 billion years ago, which is not possible in an old solar system 
model of the solar system's origin. Now, this is not an argument for a really young creation, you know, in the 10,000 year range or anything like that. It's not even art an argument against a solar system that's 1 billion years old. However, it is an argument against the solar system that is 5 billion years old. It just doesn't work. You know, so what would old solar system astronomers suggest? They, they have an explanation, and it's a little bit uh, speculative, but their explanation is that the current figure, like 3.8 centimeters per year, is unusually high because the ocean tides right now are historically abnormal due to the location of the continents on the Earth, particularly in the Americas. The idea being that where the continents and the oceans were, you know, in the distant past would have been different, and that would have caused the tidal forces to not be quite so strong. It's a speculative explanation, but nobody can really know because we can't go back in the past and look. However, while we're familiar with this, um, Saturn's moons, all of the moons of Saturn's inside of Titan, the big, big moon of Saturn, um, they are doing the very same thing that our moon is. They are moving away from Saturn too fast. And uh, they're all closer to Saturn than Earth's moon is to Earth. So the tidal acceleration of the moon thing that we discussed for Earth and our moon, the situation is worse for Saturn and its moons. Now, it's probably worse for Uranus and its moons, too, but we just don't know enough about the tidal characteristics of Uranus to, to say for sure. But probably is. This is now recognized as a problem for an old uh, solar system. And I'm just showing you this picture again because this is a really unique picture. Um, Uranus is an unusual planet in that it's not rotating along the same plane as the rest of the planets in the solar system. It's kind of tipped head over tea kettle, so it's like rotating on its side. So you can take a photo from the James Webb Space Telescope, and what you're doing is with Uranus, you can take a photo that's like top down. So we're looking at Uranus from the top instead of from the side. It's the only planet that we can do that. But if you take a long, uh, extended uh, action photo from, from the James Webb Space Telescope, beautiful new space telescope that NASA's developed, you get this view of Uranus. Uranus right there in the middle. You can see where some of the inner moons are orbiting and little star-like things which show some of the larger outer moons. And on the same picture, you can also see in the background are other distant galaxies. It's really amazing. None of that has anything to do with this presentation, though. So now let's talk about tidal deceleration. Uh, a minute ago, we talked about tidal acceleration, where the planet is orbiting, like the uh, planet is rotating, like Earth. It's rotating faster than the moon is orbiting. But what would happen if this was reversed? Instead of having an accelerating effect like this picture shows, what would happen if the moon was going around the planet faster than the planet is rotating? Well, that's actually happening with Phobos and the planet Mars. Mars, the planet, and Phobos being its inner moon. Phobos is close to Mars, and it orbits very, very fast. Well, then, instead of accelerating the moon, you have a deceleration effect. And so Phobos is slowing down and Mars, its rotation is speeding up. Um, so that's the thing that happens with Phobos. Now this is a picture of Phobos. It might look a little bit like it's an unusual shaped planet, but if you look at the surface, it seems maybe like a, it's a little bit clean. Uh, and there's probably a reason for that. Phobos is getting closer to Mars at about two centimeters per year. Now, here's the thing where we've measured it. It seems to be getting closer at two centimeters per year. 
the equations indicate that it ought to be at about three and a half centimeters per year. So it's, it is getting closer, but it's not at the rate that the equations we would use would tend to predict. Part of that is because we don't really know quite enough about the internal tidal characteristics of the moon Phobos or the planet Mars. But Phobos is only 6,000 kilometers from Mars now. This is close to what's called the Roche limit. The Roche limit is a limit to where a moon can't actually get any closer than that because if it did, the gravity and the tidal forces from the planet would tear it apart. That's what happened to that comet that I showed you earlier. The uh, tidal forces from Jupiter were stronger than the internal ability of the comet to hold together. Now Phobos, if it was a liquid, like if it was made of water, then it would already be too close and would have been torn apart because Phobos is at 88% um, of its Roche limit. The reason it hasn't fallen apart like that is because it's not liquid, it's solid. So, it, you know, it has a tendency to, to stick together. However, since it's getting closer, the tidal forces from Mars are going to only get stronger and that means that it's going to break up any time within the next 30 to 50 million years or so. So take a good look at Phobos. It's not always going to be there. Interestingly, there are 10 more moons in the solar system that are closer to their planet in a percentage terms than Phobos is. So that's a little bit of an issue for an old solar system model, too. It's that a large percentage of the solar system's regular moons are going to be destroyed in the next upcoming 1% of a 4.6 billion year solar system history. And this is a little graph of some of those moons. Phobos on the far left, it's at 88% of the Roche limit. It's this one on the very far left. But if you go a little bit further along, you can see the moon Pan is lower than that. Daphnis, Atlas, some others a little bit more, some others a little bit less. I think I counted 10 that are closer than uh, Phobos, so they're all going to get torn up. So let's talk about tidal locking. Earth's moon is tidally locked, and what that means is that we always see the same side. We always see the same side of the moon. Other moons in the solar system are also tidally locked. All the regular in inner moons in the solar system, as far as we can tell, are tidally locked. In other words, they rotate exactly one time per orbit. And so their same, their same face is always facing their planet. All the irregular moons that we know of, without exception, are not tidally locked. And for planets, of course, no planets are tidally locked because we all rotate. Except for Mercury, Mercury is a bit of a special case. I'll talk about it in a minute. Tidal locking. Okay, let's talk about if a moon is rotating. This shows a, a picture of a, a moon is rotating. Now, the tidal forces of the planet are pulling against the rotation of the moon. That's going to cause the, uh, the planet to sort of, I mean, the moon to sort of stop rotating eventually, and it'll lock. Now, you might wonder, since moons don't have water, if tidal forces act on them. And the answer is absolutely they do. But it's just on Earth, it's really obvious because you see the liquid water. But even the moon raises continental tides. It actually stretches out the solid part of the Earth by a foot or so. Uh, so it's not just the, the water that gets stretched. And likewise, the same thing happens with all the moons. And the, the force is, tends to be a lot stronger because if you're rotating around the planet, the, the tidal force from the planet is much greater. So that will be a strong tidal force, unlike the moon being the smaller body pulling on us. It's kind of a weak tidal force. So given enough time, a moon is going to uh, get locked to its planet. Now, here's the thing where we who are young Earth creationists have some explaining to do. Tidal locking works too slowly to lock most of the moons in a young solar system. A young solar system, say, 
less than 10,000 years. In an old solar system, tidal locking works too slowly to lock any planets to the sun except for Mercury. And Mercury is sort of locked to the sun, but it's abnormal. It's a, it takes three rotations and uh, two orbits. So it's kind of a special case. So is this evidence for an old solar system? Because the tidal locking, if you start with moons that are spinning, um, there hasn't been enough time to get them to lock. And if you start it with planets to spinning, there hasn't been enough time to get those to lock either, except in an old solar system, you've got enough time to lock some of those interior regular moons, and you've got enough time to lock Mercury in an old solar system. So that could, so it could be considered an argument for an old solar system. Now, for a young Earth creationist like me, we would have to say that what this has done is that the, the red line there is quite important. We have to assume that the locked moons in Mercury were created that way. There hasn't been enough time for tidal forces to, to start with a spinning moon and to lock them. So we have to assume that they were created that way. Now note that we can only speculate, and really everybody can only speculate about initial solar system conditions like how fast were moons originally spinning? Nobody really knows. But having said that now, there's some issues. Like the, okay, to begin with, the ice giant planets, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune, they are too far away from the sun for tidal locking to have any effect at all. And so they actually spin pretty fast, which is what you'd expect. They spin oh, roughly about, they, were, they spin about 12 hours, they go all the way around. For the inner planets, tidal locking could have an effect, but no inner planet is actually cooperating perfectly based on what you'd expect. Like I mentioned before, Mercury is a little bit of a special case with a three spin to two orbit rate. Venus is rotating very slowly, but it's actually going backwards. It's rotating backwards. Um, Hard to come up with a reason why that would happen. Some people speculate maybe it got hit by something. Um, it's hard to say. And then finally, Earth is actually rotating a little bit faster than Mars. Now, this is not what you would expect based on an old solar system and tidal locking because Earth is closer to the sun. So the sun would have a much more powerful tendency to get us slowed down. Um, furthermore, we're being slowed down by having a big moon. Mars doesn't have a big moon. It has very small moons. Also, as a comment about tidal locking, planets which are outside of our solar system, we now know a little bit about some of those. In most cases, they're rather large planets like Jupiter, and they're kind of close to their star. But since they're close to their star, they're usually going to be tidally locked. That means that they're going to get baked on one side, frozen on the other. So back to my comment about a creationist, a young Earth creationist is going to have to assume that regular moons would have been created locked and rather spinning. Is there a reason why that might have to have been done that way? Well, maybe so. It may be due to tidal heat. The picture there is a picture of the moon Io, and on the far left side, you can see what's actually a volcano uh, going off on Io. Tidal heat on Io is so great that it creates volcanic activity. Now, Io is locked to Jupiter, and if Io was in a perfectly circular orbit, there would be no tidal heating because it would just always have the same face to Jupiter, it would always be the same distance. It would never change shape at all, so there would be no heating. But Io is not quite in a circular orbit. It's really close. It's only a little bit elliptical. But because it's elliptical, what happens is the tidal force is greater when Io is closer and less when Io is farther from Jupiter. So it gets stronger and weaker, and it's like squeezing a tennis ball um, constantly as it orbits around Jupiter. Now, that effect 
is causing friction and the friction causes heat and that's what makes Io so extremely hot. Now, like I said, this is actually with a circular orbit and it's locked. If the moon was rotating, then the tidal heating would be tremendously more. It, uh, the fact that it's locked means that the tidal heating isn't that much. But if you can imagine the moon was rotating, then that would mean that high tides were moving all around the planet every time it rotated. And that would create vastly more tidal heat. So I don't know what exactly that would do to the regular moons, which are locked now, but it might make them, who knows, all volcanic or all, I, I don't know. It's hard to uh, figure out how significant this would be. But a rotating moon would certainly generate more tidal heat, and I believe it would be more by orders of magnitude. In any case, tidal forces in the solar system, they need uh, further study. I wrote a paper on this, so I know some about it, but I can tell you it really needs further study. Not a lot of people have looked at it very closely. Uh, the tidal characteristics of the planets and moons are understood very well for the Earth and the moon, but those are the only ones that we know really very well. We need to understand characteristics for other planets like what the, the heat dissipation factor is a variable that goes, in, goes into many of these calculations. And that, you know, that's an indication of how easily a planet stretches, so to speak. And, and we just don't know that for most of the planets and moons in the solar system. This topic of tidal forces is like less exciting than the study of the origin of the universe. But you know, there's so much more good data. It's just our solar system. Everything is close and you can see it really well. When people are trying to look at figuring out the origin of the solar system, we're looking so far out that we can scarcely even see or imagine what's going on out there. But so I think tidal forces in the solar system are an interesting thing that we could study, definitely an opportunity for more research in this area. So that's my third presentation on the solar system series. And the next one coming up will be on magnetic fields in the solar system. Thank you for watching.